Welcome to episode 34 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. The topic for today is investing in restaurant real estate with Kevin Burke of Trinity Capital. This is a topic we haven't yet discussed on the program, but I think it's important to talk about because there's some really interesting changes taking place in the market for a variety of reasons. The restaurant business is typically thought of as a high risk, low profit margin business, but I get the impression from this discussion that a lot of the risks associated with the asset class are significantly mitigated when you invest in some of the top 100 or top 50 brands in the US, which is our guest's general strategy. Today, we're going to get into the details of restaurant real estate and find out where the opportunity currently exists in the space, what the four main sectors are within the restaurant business and which one of those sectors are most recession resistant, which I think is really important. We're also gonna talk about technology and how technological advances may impact the restaurant business as a whole. And then also the Amazon threat. This is something a lot of people have been talking about in the industry, which is obviously Amazon has an incredible distribution capacity. They also recently bought Whole Foods. So how is this really going to impact the sector as a whole? And then how are the preferences of millennials shifting the restaurant business and what impact might this have? So obviously, we're going to discuss a lot of topics today. Definitely should make for an interesting conversation. I'm really looking forward to your feedback on this episode. Now, before we get to the episode, just a reminder, if you haven't yet signed up for an account with Cashflow Connections, make sure to go to cashflowconnections.com, create an account, and sign up as an accredited investor. We have a consistent amount of deal flow when it comes to recession-resistant assets, most notably mobile home parks and self-storage. So if you're interested in diversifying into those niche, weird real estate investments, we can help you out. So go to cashflowconnections.com, sign up, get an account, and we'd be happy to get you cash flowing immediately. All right, hope you enjoy the episode. How's it going, everyone? Today, we are joined by Kevin Burke, who is the founder and managing partner of Trinity Capital, which is a private investment banking firm that has completed more than $20 billion in mergers and acquisitions. Kevin is a regular speaker on a variety of different topics, including the restaurant industry, franchising, as well as the economy. His restaurant expertise and knowledge makes him and his firm a go-to source for many prominent firms that consult with the restaurant industry's business leaders. Trinity has an extensive list of high-level clients, including Bain Capital, Goldman Sachs Private Capital, the Carlisle Group, and many more. So obviously, we're going to discuss some topics today, which we haven't discussed previously on the program. So I'm really excited about this one. Th Kevin, thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Hunter. So before we jump into the, the topics for the day, which have a lot to do with the restaurant business, let's talk about a little bit about your background. How did you get started? How did you end up founding Trinity in the first place? Well, I'd been, I'd had a career on Wall Street uh, with Dylan Reed, uh, L.F. Rothschild, Unterberg Tobin, and Prudential Securities. And I moved out to Los Angeles and worked for a boutique firm for uh, a year or so. And then I uh, got a crazy idea to start a company that would uh, be backed by asset backed security groups on Wall Street and would make loans uh, to uh, initially gas stations, which you know nobody wanted to lend money to in those days. And then secondarily, we got into restaurants. And the idea was that in, in those days, you could only borrow against real estate or a personal guarantee. And the banks were very, very skittish because of the high failure rate in global restaurants. But what we were doing is working exclusively with chains. And there's a lot of mom and pop restaurants that are not good credits, and and you know the restaurant failure rate in the uh, in in the standard industrial classification codes, if you will, uh, the stand the failure rate is very very high, and it would scare off any banker. But we looked at the the top 100 chains and discovered the failure rate was you know considerably less than one percent, and so we came along with collateralized mortgage obligation style financing, CMO financing, and it caught on like wildfire. And you know, the first year, I think we financed around a hundred million. Um, and within three years, we were, you know, at a run rate of a billion and a half. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. So j just to be clear, you were providing the financing for people who wanted to franchise or create their own restaurants as long as they were within that, that chain model. That's right. That's right. And we, you know, we looked at organizations that, you know, were not 
single unit, you know, borrowers. And, um, you know, we, we gradually got more comfortable with certain credits and, and relaxed some standards. But, uh, you know, it was a su successful model. We were securitizing CMO style with different tranches of financing, much like uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities financing, which sure. would be, you know, a triple A, double A, single A, triple B, double B, single B, and an equity piece in an uh, interest-only strip. Uh, and that was extremely efficient financing, and it really took the restaurant industry by storm. Interesting. So in terms of the restaurant industry as a whole, it's my understanding there's about four major sectors in that business. Could you kind of break down those four sectors and and where you see, I guess, some of the opportunity in each sector, or give an example of restaurants within each sector? Sure, sure. So, I mean, the, there's the standard, uh, you know, industry jargon for restaurant grouping is uh, uh, QSR, which is quick service restaurants, or what many people call fast food. Uh, then there's casual dining, which is uh, restaurants such as uh, Applebee's, uh, uh, TGIF Fridays, um, Olive Garden, Red Lobster, and there's a couple hundred concepts like that around the nation that are either super regional or national platforms. And those are casual dining restaurants. They serve alcoholic beverages and they have sit down table service. Then there are fine dining, which typically people use a distinction of, you know, a tablecloth. And that would include things like uh, Ruth Chris, uh, Arnie Morton's, uh, McCormick and Schmick's, and, you know, chains like that. Um, there is a kind of a, a new category called fast casual, um, which is uh, it's in between fast food and casual dining uh, in terms of price point. Um, and also it, they tend not to serve uh, alcoholic beverages as a high percentage of sales. They do offer them, but you know, as a percentage of sales, they typically around, you know, five, six, 7%. And they, those restaurants, uh, generally do not have uh, table service. Uh, you go up to a counter and put your order in. There, there are tables in the restaurant, but uh, without service, it, it allows them to have a little more efficient pricing and price point. And a, a great example of that would be uh, Chipotle or any of the designer pizza concepts such as Blaze or 800 Degrees or Mod or, and so forth. Okay, I've got it. And I appreciate kind of breaking those down. So where is the majority of your focus within those segments? Well, we spend most of our effort on uh, quick service restaurants, fast food, if you will, and casual dining. Um, and of course, we do, you know, business in all of the sectors. Um, and, you know, we do a fair amount of uh, real estate transactions in both those categories as well. And, you know, those are generally, you know, a, Good real estate investments, historically, they've returned very nicely. Uh, the restaurants are stable. They tend to, you know, stay in the same location for, you know, long lease periods, you know, 25, 30, 35 years. Um, there are thousands and thousands of restaurants that were built in the 1960s that are still in the same spot today. It may not be the same building, um, and it's certainly been remodeled several times, but, you know, good locations, uh, you know, are, are hard to find and, and, and they stay good and they typically uh, uh, make great investments in some of those legacy spots. You know, you see cap rates today at, um, you know, unbelievably low levels. We've seen them as low as 375, four, four and a quarter, uh, you know, uh, up to five in, you know, major, major DMAs on the, you know, right corner in the center of town where the volume of, uh, of the restaurant is right at the high for the national average. Wow, I'm 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 pretty surprised to hear that that they'd be low in that in that range. So when people are looking to invest in restaurants, when you you said like sub 4, sub 5 for example, would that be a standard cap rate for a QSR type of business or is that closer to the family dining style or does it matter? No, actually that's a that's a good question, Hunter. Um it's not standard. It's basically the, the the perfect corner in a you know in a top fifty DMA, if you will, okay. with the right the right chain, and and obviously you know the strength of the chain. I mean, if you're looking at um, if you're looking at a chain restaurant on the lease as opposed to a franchisee, it's going to be a much much lower cap. Certainly, Starbucks, 
McDonald's, Chipotle, Yum Brands. You know, when you look at uh, counterparties like that, you're going to have very, very low cap rates. And generally, they're going to be fishing for 1031 exchanges and, and, and uh, investors who are um, – who might have a short time frame and don't mind paying a little more to get something that's fast, easy, safe, and uh, quote, like kind, uh, unquote. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Where do you think the majority of the opportunity is right now, given the current state of the restaurant business? I guess, give us an idea of where you think we are in terms of the cycle as a whole, and then where the real opportunity is going forward in the next five or 10 years, let's say. Sure. Well, you know, I think we're... uh, uh, in a cyclical phase, I mean, we really have tried to try to beat up the business cycle, try to eliminate it with with nice. all the stimulus. Central central bank stimulus around the world has you know come at unprecedented levels, and and I think it's created uh, unprecedented challenges for us in terms of you know the amount of debt that's out there, what that means for uh, future financing, future deficit spending, future interest rates. Um, I think that if you look at the uh, the ECB and Bank of Japan and the Federal Reserve are all quietly trying to figure out um, how to shrink balance sheets and how to uh, make interest rates uh, attractive, uh, you know, for investors and not, you know, get away from this, the 100% stimulus mode. Um, and that's that's a I think you know the, the big theme right now in where we are in the cycle. If um, if the if those three central banks continue in the direction of uh, of tightening, but not enough to hurt the economy, I think that we have some legs in this economy. We can go into you know well into next year without um, without any damaging uh, you know uh, changes in, in business activity or end of the cycle, if you will. Um, however, if if they get more aggressive to either support their currency or or, or other issues. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we could, uh, you know, this, this, um, you know, this cycle could end, you know, relatively quickly. So, uh, you know, when you look at the Dow 26,000, you look at commodities are all at great levels, but turning up, you know, interest rates are turning up, you know, there's a lot of headwinds out there, I think. And, you know, my thoughts are that we're going to have substantially more whitewater in front of us and behind us in 2019. And this year, I think because of the tax bill, uh, continued uh, hangover of stimulus, uh, I think we should be in pretty good shape, certainly for the real estate market. You know, leases tend to be longer, and so the um, you tend to have a muted, you know, a, a recession might hurt somebody who's trying to market a property. It's not going to hurt somebody who owns one uh, with a good rent roll uh, that's, you know, going to last for some time. Totally, totally. And that kind of goes back to those main chains, particularly in those top 50 um, cities, for example. Uh, I I read one of your quarterly reports recently that actually showed that some of the same store growth was actually contracting, which I was actually kind of surprised to hear given the massive run-up we've had, things like stocks, commodities, et cetera. Um, What are your thoughts on that same store growth? And to, to kind of parlay about your comment about the recession, which one of those categories in the restaurant business is less prone to those kind of recessionary elements or times in the in the economy? Well, that that's a great question, Hunter, because, you know, in, in terms of real estate investors looking for safe places to put money, um, you know, uh, you know, we always say go big or go home. And certainly if you're with the quick service restaurant chains that, you know, are, you know, 20, 30, 40, in the case of McDonald's, $100 billion enterprises, um, those have all the staying power you could ask for, and the concepts have large advertising budgets. They have, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand stores nationwide, or fifteen in the case of, you know, McDonald's, Subway, and and Starbucks. Um, and and you you know, there's safety in numbers. Um, so you know, I, I think that the QSR space is uh, the safest. I think that the larger casual dining chains uh, are are safe places to put money, and that would include you know, Darden that that operates uh, Olive Garden and Longhorn and a couple other concepts. Uh, 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 Dine Equity, which operates uh, uh, IHOP and Applebee's. Uh, you know, these are companies that have resources that have uh, a history with clientele 
um, a lot of brand strength, panache with customers, and and really have the best chance to get into the next generation. And that's really where the risk is in this business is, uh, you know, the next generation is not going to exhibit the same buying patterns as the former generations. And retailers that get that are winners, and retailers that are sort of flat-footed with that are suffering. And I think that, you know, when you think about the restaurant business, um, looking at it demographically, um, looking at the five generations, you know, generations X, Y, and Z, baby boomers, and the greatest generation, um, if, you can, if you can attract millennials, you probably have growing sales. And if you don't have any cachet with millennials, you're probably losing sales, albeit you may raise prices, which masks the loss of traffic. But, you know, P times Q, you know, price times quantities, total revenue. Uh, there's a lot of price uh, increases in the last 36 months that have covered up a multitude of sins of, you know, declining traffic in the restaurant business. So, you know, I, I would say that the, a lot of the legacy chains, the one that started in the 50s and the 60s, they've really struggled with uh, millennials. And, and most of their business is coming from the older half of Gen X and then, of course, um, baby boomers and the greatest generation. The problem with that clientele is that among baby boomers and, and the greatest generation, 50,000 people a day are getting uh, a cane or a walker or a wheelchair or a nursing home or worse yet, a tombstone. And, you know, and then they cease to be customers or at least frequent ones. And that's a big challenge for the legacy brands, you know, the older brands. And I think if you look at McDonald's, they're the ones that are publicly exhibiting that angst the most in terms of how they're trying to reposition themselves for millennials. Because, you know, my four kids, um, you know, they, they, they're afraid of the, the golden arches. They think that, you know, Ronald McDonald looks like a meth lab cook and they just simply are not going to make that switch uh, until McDonald's really changes its image. And image changing is, you know, sort of a five, 10 year plan, not, not a, you know, a three year plan. Totally. And so just to, I mean, I have some assumptions about some of the pivots that some of the companies are making. I'm certainly not looking at the data in the way you are. I'm assuming that a lot of these brands are, are focusing more on health foods. Um, I know that Chipotle has had a lot of success with their pricing model in terms of the service that they're offering. But, you know, from your perspective, what are these brands doing to change their perspective to, to draw in more millennial clients? Well, I think that uh, a great example is, you know, Applebee's. Applebee's has always had, you know, a, uh, a little flow of millennials because if nothing else, uh, parents are bringing millennials into the restaurants. Um, but Applebee's uh, new CEO, John Cywinski, has done a fabulous job of uh, changing the advertising to make it more millennial friendly, uh, coming up with a bunch of really creative uh, drink specials. And there's all kinds of social media buzz about uh, Applebee's now. And they really stunned the industry in terms of showing, hey, look, this doesn't have to be a 10 year program. There's some things you can do. And the short term, and of course, casual dining has more tools because they've got alcohol and, and other other things they can do, but uh, such as delivery and so forth. But you know, I do think that um, reaching out to millennials means having a digital presence that's real, having uh, a uh, a social media profile that resonates, uh, tolling that, you know, making sure you're constantly checking. Uh, you know, your hits and your activity, the number of followers you have and so forth, making sure that you advertise on social media and and really trying to change the perception so that it doesn't look corporate. Millennials don't want to go into a cookie cutter, you know, paper doll, uh, you know, paper doll cut uh, concept. They want each concept to be somewhat individual. And I think that in the case of Applebee's, they've really tried to, you know, put sports memorabilia from local teams on the wall, have managers and hostesses that are uh, that are locals that understand that know people uh, and make it more of a neighborhood bar and grill than a corporate one where any restaurant in the United States you walk into is going to be homogeneous and say and do the same thing, which feels uh, corporate, which is not what you know millennials want. 
Wow, that's really interesting. That's so much more detailed than I, I was expecting in terms of, you know, just being a client of some of these restaurants. So yeah, I definitely appreciate the breakdown there. Where do you think the the real opportunity is in this sector? Is it in development? Is it in value add? Is it in some kind of combination of the both or in stabilized? Where, where do you think that the real favorable risk adjusted returns can be found in the restaurant business? Well, I, I think there's really three things. Um, you know, buying and owning uh, chains that are millennial centric is going to be very profitable. Certainly over the last uh, over the last 10 years, we've seen investors that we've worked with, you know, producing um, uh, returns, you know, in between 20 and 50 percent. And um, and I think that, you know, the nice thing about you know, the restaurant business is you can really change your fortunes pretty quickly if you're if you've got the right people, uh, the right business model, and you're and you've got the right uh, approach to your customers. Um, I think on the real estate side, uh, I think there's great money to be made in buying portfolios, restaurant portfolio, restaurant real estate portfolios, and you know buy and hold them for a little while, and then breaking them off, you know, one by one, two by two, uh, in the 1031 uh, market. I think there's lots of money to be made there. Certainly portfolios can be bought, you know, at cap rates between six and nine and certainly broken off into pieces between, uh, you know, well, for some of the chains as low as, you know, three and a half or so and, uh, and, and seven, depending on what the concept is. And, you know, if, if you buy something at, at six or seven and you, you know, flip it at, at five or six, um, you know, you're, you're going to do well. And um, and I think there are bigger spreads out there, depending upon uh, what whether you're buying an A, B, or C location, and whether you're in an A, B, or C market. Um, and then, of course, the, the the Z axis of that would be the strength of the concept. And if you're dealing with top ten, and you're able to buy a portfolio uh, in the mid sixes, uh, you can definitely break those off, uh, you know, into the fives without any difficulty. Uh, and in some locations, uh, some locations have a short franchise agreement, and maybe when it expires, it's on the corner of Broad and Main. That becomes a bank branch, and the property values increases by you know at least a million dollars on top of whatever the rubrics were for the cap rate on the franchise business. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So portfolios, and then I think the other thing is, look, you can you know you can make good decisions on just buying individual properties. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in. You know, looking at the location, even if the cash flow is not interesting, um, if the property supports itself and it's on the right in the right part of town, uh, it's just a matter of how long your horizon is. Um, if you've got a, you know, a 10 or 20 year horizon and you're buying in the central business district, of you know, top 50 uh, DMAs, you know, TV signal areas, um, it's very, very hard to, uh, you know, to make mistakes there. Um, I think that. Uh, you just have to, you know, be disciplined on on purchase price and financing, but you know, I, I think that those will be uh, good investments with uh, ultimately, you know, mid-teen returns. And certainly, when you're in a a big concept, I think your 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 default risk is very very low, and uh, and you know, so a risk-adjusted return like that, I think, is very attractive vis-a-vis -vis looking at you know, apartments or uh, office or uh, you know, self-storage or industrial. Sure, sure. So when is part of the strategy then to really take a more on-site management strategy? Like, do you, do you ever identify properties that are incredibly mismanaged, even though they're under the, the major chain and say, okay, these guys are really underperforming on NOI. Let's go in, buy the property based on in-place income and effectuate a more significant management protocol? Or is that not really a strategy that's that's typically implemented? Well, for real estate uh, investors that have the ability to, um, you know, do a little more than buy and hold and triple net, um, there's a great there's a great opportunity there. And, and the opportunity would be this: um, we see a lot of uh, franchises, you know, in the in say the top 100 concepts that, you know, somebody owns 30 restaurants, their sales numbers are meaningfully below the national average. They're in a good market. The restaurants aren't in bad shape. They're not in great shape, but they're not in bad shape. And you look at it and you say, well, look, your guy owns 15 fees. If we buy this company and we restore the sales to where they should be and clean up the P&L, 
you know, we're going to have a, you know, a lot more sales and restaurant sales are, you know, in the QSR business, typically around, you know, eight, eight and a half percent of sales. If we jump sales by, you know, 20 percent and, you know, and, and we're and we're valuing these things by, a, you know, eight percent, eight and a half percent rent, uh, we've just significantly enhanced the value of the real estate. And, you know, we can turn around and sell those properties at a significant profit. Um, and that is an opportunity that, you know, people have, uh, you know, exploited. Uh, there's not a lot of people do running that strategy, but the ones that have have done very, very well. We've been, uh, we've worked with clients over the years that have done that repeatedly. And, and, and that obviously jumps your real estate returns into a, you know, real estate enhanced by a turnaround. For sure. For sure. Uh, in terms of the technology that's coming out, is there any challenges or how is technology really affecting the restaurant business as a whole? Well, I think it's going to eventually take a lot of employment out of the restaurants. And, you know, that's kind of a shame um, because, you know, minimum wage employment has served as the training grounds to feed all industries and, you know, help our youth uh, become, uh, you know, responsible, understand how to, you know, keep a job, get to a job, uh, be, be, you know, attentive to customers and learn a lot of life skills. Um, but as, you know, as minimum wage starts to, you know, creep up to 12, 14, 15, 16 dollars around the country, it's not going to work within the construct of a, of a QSR, typical P&L. And so you're going to see a lot of kiosks. Uh, you're going to see a lot of offsite, a lot of delivery, and a lot of real changes. And, and those are technology-driven, but they're certainly expedited by the cost of labor. And, you know, uh, I wrote an article in our research journal a couple years ago that was, you know, entitled, uh, you know, I found the perfect employee and his name is kiosk you know he doesn't need vacation time he won't sue you for slip and fall or sexual harassment he's never late he you know he doesn't mind working overtime and and so forth and so on so i do think that that is a wave that in 10 years will be um probably half of the uh orders taken in qsr in 10 years will probably be done uh through digital whether it's a kiosk or handheld what percentage of QSR's expenses are going towards labor? Most most of your QSR businesses are running labor lines in between uh, twenty six and thirty four percent, and the average is probably thirty. Uh, so you know, if a restaurant's doing a million five, uh, they're spending about four hundred and fifty thousand on in store labor, uh, and then of course there is uh, supervision, which is you know above the line. Uh, or below the line, excuse me, and that would, uh, you know, be an extra, you know, probably 50000 a store. But direct labor cost uh, in most QSRs at, at is, is going to be around 30%. Okay, well, that's that's extremely significant. And you may not have these numbers offhand, but I'm also interested in to how much of that labor is minimum wage. Is that extremely common? Is that the majority? I mean, just a ballpark would be beneficial. Yeah. You know, in, in the old days, it was the bulk of it. And I think nowadays people have figured out that if minimum wage is uh, $9, you're not going to get a good employee for 9 So I think that, you know, particularly we deal a lot with the, of course, top 100 concepts and, and really a lot with like the top 25. When you're in that top 25, very little if anybody is paying minimum wage. They want okay. a better employee. They're going to pay a little more. And so you're going to see people offering, you know, 10 10 50 to start. And they, that's just they, they want to – an employee that is a little more responsible, um, a little better educated. And, you know, typically what they're looking for is, you know, a college student that wants to be, you know, part-time and is, uh, uh, you know, a great face in the customer, super responsible, needs the money, and is not going to, you know, quit their job because you didn't give them off Saturday night and they wanted to go see, you know, uh, you know, Jay-Z concert or whatever. Right. So I guess other than the, the potential risk of the increasing minimum wages, which are taking place over a lot of different cities, uh, what are some of the other challenges that you see the restaurant business facing right now? Well, I think you got to be careful. If you're a real estate investor, you want to be looking at the, the P&L of your tenant. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little different than, uh, than, you know, multifamily or, you know, something that is, uh, you know, at the top of the food chain where it's going to happen no matter what. Um, you know, you look at a hedge fund paying $100 a foot uh, for rent, 
on Park Avenue in New York City, um, the, the rent numbers sound staggering, especially to those of us that don't live in New York. Uh, but when you think about it, it's a rounding error for the hedge funds P&L. It's not even 1% of, of uh, revenue, and they just don't even care about rent expense. But when you look at restaurants, you know, a lot of them are paying, you know, 8% of sales. Um, sometimes if they're not doing well, they start at 8, sales fall, and their rents could be 10 or 11. If you have double-digit rent, you should look carefully at the P&L, and the things you should be paying attention to are uh, labor, uh, food cost, uh, interest rates, you know, in terms of debt service, and, uh, and controllable costs. And those are ones that you should really take a close look at just to make sure that your tenant is, you know, minding the store and, you know, not going to get any surprises. And I think increasingly, increasingly we see uh, landlords asking for financials, not just when they sign the lease, but, you know, uh, certainly the public REITs ask for annual audits um, for portfolios and reviewed statements for, you know, small clusters of stores. And now we see them asking for, do you mind just giving us quarterly sales? So I do think that there is an intensification of, you know, paying attention to the P&L. And the things to look for, again, are uh, labor, cost of goods sold, uh, the interest cost, and what they call controllables, which is a whole laundry list of, uh, you know, items in the P&L that get wrapped into a single line. So I have got to ask a question that I think – almost every industry is constantly asking, which is what's going on with Amazon? How does this have the potential to affect the business? I, I know that when Whole Foods was purchased by Amazon, for example, there must have been some kind of reaction. What are your thoughts on what Amazon is doing, particularly as it relates to the, the restaurant business? Sure. Well, you know, Amazon would love to get into uh, uh, the delivery business. Um, and I think that when you look at the, what technology is doing to restaurants, it's really inviting restaurants to share their margin with delivery. Um, the, the notion of having somebody sitting on their couch at home watching Netflix, uh, picking up their, their uh, cell phone and, and putting an order in is, um, is a very powerful uh, trend. And I think that Amazon, by, by buying Whole Foods, does have a leg into creating prepared food in those stores and delivering it and creating prepared food that is um, markedly better than in, in terms of quality and, and presentation uh, and, and healthiness. Uh, and that's a big threat to the business. Um, I think if you look uh, at some of the byproducts of this, if you if you're a real estate investor in a Whole Food property and and Amazon just bought them, uh, you've probably seen a significant increase in the credit quality of your lease, and you know that will trans transfer itself to property valuation. Um, I do believe that uh, that Amazon Amazon does uh, is working on strategic plans to see how you know home delivery food service can work and where, you know, what price point they'll establish themselves at because they do have a little more expensive, you know, raw materials and their price point's going to be higher. And I think that, you know, they will, you know, methodically roll themselves out, but it, there will not be uh, a lot of passage of time before uh, Amazon really puts its footprint on how to, how to efficiently deliver to the home. And I think the other thing on the other side of, you know, Amazon's ambitions is I think they'll want to control uh, delivery and transportation uh, up and down the food train, depending upon what the Department of Justice will let them get away with. <laughs> so I think if they could buy FedEx, they do it in a nanosecond. And I think that if they could buy uh, Uber or any of the, you know, 15 or 20 uh, delivery services, uh, they would do that as well. So it'll be interesting to see with their capital and their political influence, you know, what they're able to pull off. But with the resources they have, um, I would not bet against them. How do you anticipate the Affordable Care Act having an impact on the on the restaurant business as a whole? And, and which sectors do you think that that will most affect? Well, I mean, I think the the, the recent tax bill uh, you know, took away the obligatory, um, uh, you know, payment side of that. And I think that's a big change. Um, 
But you know what's happened uh, with most most restaurant companies that were in the position to have to uh, offer health care to all employees, uh, you know, did so judiciously, and then just simply the the copay from uh, copay is the wrong term, but the the percentage covered by the employer um, is you know pretty Spartan compared to what it was in the old days. In the old days, they would cover managers because crew level in the restaurant business is mostly transient jobs, jobs that last on average about six months. Um, and managers and so forth had the opportunity to participate and they would have some payment scheme that would be with the employer paying anywhere from uh, 25 to 75% of the, uh, the monthly bill, depending upon who it was. Um, I pay 75% for my employees um, and you know the restaurants are all over the spectrum. Uh, right. But I do think the that the the restaurant industry has adroitly handled uh, the Affordable Care Act, and I think that now that the mandatory payment provisions are are out, it's not really a uh, uh, it's it's not a, 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 a it's no longer the big issue it was when they were debating the legislation. Okay, that makes sense. And is there any other legislative actions that you're currently seeing coming down the pipeline that you think could have a significant impact on the restaurant, uh, the restaurant business, or or the economy overall? Well, I do think that you know we're going in the right direction with regulation. Um, you know, there, there's always uh, government always has the in, impossible challenge of trying to balance over regulation or not enough regulation. Um, Clearly, you know, we have to protect the environment. Clearly, we have to, you know, look out for worker safety, public safety. Clearly, we have to have free markets, but we have to have balance so there's no predatory pricing or abusive policies. Uh, but we need to do that in a way that makes us competitive around the globe. And it's a challenge because there are some countries that, you know, do not have the regulatory bootstraps we have. And so it's a, it's a real challenge, you know, the left and right fight about this all the time. But, you know, we need the right balance. I do think that you know, the pendulum swung a little too far, um, and we have, you know, uh, loosened some things up. Uh, I like to see that, but I like to also see sustainable policy that's prudent, that doesn't harm future generations, um, and, you know, that that's the, the challenge that Congress has got to make sure uh, they, they strike a good balance. The, the biggest risks, of course, you know, are interest rate, uh, minimum wage legislation, um, uh, any kind of, um, uh, you know, development constraints, uh, you know, clearly if you, if you look at the amount of, uh, paperwork that it takes to build a, uh, a quick service restaurant, uh, in LA County versus say, um, uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, there's a big difference. And, um, in, you know, I don't pretend to have all the answers, uh, but somewhere in the middle of the, of the two of those is probably the right answer. Um, and, you know, we, we frequently see people spending, you know, a year and a half, sometimes two years before they can break ground. And I, I think that that is um, a bit of a disincentive toward, you know, uh, development and growth. Are there any segments of the restaurant business that you're completely staying away from that you think that it's, you know, the timing is not right for whatever reason? Are there any segments that are really giving you pause or, or fear in that sector? Well, I think there's always, you know, migration of, uh, of taste and preferences. Uh, there's concepts that are, you know, have their halcyon days are behind them. And you always got to be, you know, on the lookout for that. I, there, there's no sectors that we avoid, but we clearly are very picky about the concepts that we uh, spend time with because, you know, we really want to be uh, centered in uh, concepts that have great sustainability, great future growth prospects. and because that makes it easier to make, you know, business and and capital uh, markets and uh, capital structure and real estate decisions. Awesome. Well, one one more question, Kevin. Do you have any advice for young real estate investors, entrepreneurs that really are looking to streamline their career to avoid major mistakes, time wasting tasks, stuff like that? Or any any takeaways that you can give um, based on your success in this space? Well, I think, you know, for career advice to somebody that's in an organization, uh, a large organization, I, I think you really need to, you know, continue your education to, you know, with graduate school. I think uh, outside reading is critical. I think that, you know, getting really good assessments about 
you know, uh, character and personality development, make sure that you are uh, at the top of the list of an HR department in one of these large organizations. I think on the other side, on the entrepreneurial side, uh, as a, you know, an investor that's, you know, buying one, one or two locations and, you know, hopefully one day wanting to have a lot, you know, I, I think you've got to establish a good reputation. You've got to have good quantitative skills. You've got to have good banking relationships. Uh, you've got to have an eye for detail and, and really make sound fundamental decisions that will, you know, set, set the stage for, uh, uh, good business or real estate holdings down the road. Awesome. Well, again, Kevin, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, definitely talked about a lot of different topics. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Hunter. All right, listeners, thanks for checking out the episode. As always, the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page, which is hosted on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Don't forget, if you want access to some of the free goodies that I'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes, like free eBooks, weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment-related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again.